Welcome to Civility and American Democracy, a national forum. Presented by the Center for Civil Discourse at the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. In partnership with Mass Humanities, WBUR Radio, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Moderating today's discussion, the host of WBUR's On Point, Tom Ashbrook. And to conclude, we take this day's conversation very much into the heart of the public arena. For you here on Boston Harbor and around the country, we're glad you've stayed for this. We hope it's good. We're talking in this session about civility, politics, and the media. Uh, and the question's here. Is the media part of the problem or part of the solution? In the competitive, ratings-driven world of mass media, where is the market for civility? And is the problem of incivility a fiction propagated by the media? We've got a panel of distinguished journalists with us today and very, very happy to have them. Ellen Goodman, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, speaker and commentator, a former colleague. Great to have you with us, Ellen. Thank you. The great Joe Klein, Time Magazine columnist. Joe, thanks so much for being here. And the wonderful Kathleen Parker, Pulitzer Prize winning syndicated columnist for the Washington Post. Kathleen, welcome. All right, now we're in my clubhouse. I know journalists, we're out of the academic woods. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, we're gonna give them the honor of the podium. I have a feeling they'll be much more brief at it and then we'll dive right on in. <laughs> Ellen, you're on. This is perfect coming at the end of the day where we've all disagreed on so many things. Now we can all agree that it's the media's fault, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> um, I just wanted to start by telling you this is the second time this year that I've, a, in the last 12 months, I've attempted to talk about civility. And the first one is my own story. Uh, I was invited to speak at St. Francis in Western Pennsylvania last fall, and they asked me what the topic was, and I said, let's talk about civility in the name of my speech will be a civil tongue. And a week before I was, at, I was supposed to go there, I was canceled <laughs> for the first time in my life. And why was I canceled? Because the university uh, discovered that I was pro-choice. So you will understand that my speech had nothing to do with abortion, reproductive rights, birth control, or anything. But the uh, university had been, there were Catholic watchdogs who have been watching speeches at Catholic universities, and they watched me. So in one of the supreme ironies of life, I was banned from speaking about civility. <laughs> <laughs> so after the morning of listening to the academics, I'd like to go back for just a few minutes, and journalists do keep to time and space. Uh, and, and talk about a much more everyday version of the civility issue, which, has, which thinks about incivility as the angry, polarized voices that we hear in our, daily, in our daily lives. And I think that it is true that what Americans hear in politics and in the media leaves us feeling like observers at a tennis match, rapidly moving our head from side to side, waiting for another overhead slam rather than a solution to our problems. So I will go through and, uh, um, the academics this morning, tamp down a kind of alarmist view about that in the long view of history, and as they say, in the long run, we'll all be dead. So I'm gonna do it in a much more short run version, which is to say simply that the polarizing of politics has happened in sync with the polarizing of the media, and in some ways, those two things are connected. Um, the political commentary in the blogosphere, in the world of Facebook and Twitter, in radio, uh, has become so, Richard, so rigid that many do feel uh, they'd rather win than make the country work. In a Pew study, people blamed radio and TV and reality programs for our uncivil tongues, and there's some truth in that. A lot of people have picked up on the language 
of talk radio and imitate it, or on the anonymity of the internet and of the blogosphere, and that has become a kind of acceptable version of speaking in public. And those of us on the other side of those emails know all about it. Um, so what is wrong with food fight journalism and food fight politics? What Austin Serrett this morning referred to as the battle of the world has become the norm. And to me, it's not just impoliteness, some mismanners violation that is the problem with it. It's that everyone is now required in the public to be so certain and so simplistic. Uh, there is no immediate penalty that I can see for a politician turning a deficit debate into a character assassination, and there is no penalty for reducing complexity into a tweet. So Jill Laporte said that we don't have two points of view, but we do have two parties. And I think that's very important to think about because it's my sense that Americans feel ambivalent and often quite complex feelings about many of the issues of the past decade, whether abortion or gay marriage or Iraq or Afghanistan, but we almost never hear that ambivalence in the public media. What we do hear, what passes for ambivalence, are two sides of people throwing food at each other, speaking with absolute certainty on opposite sides of the issue. Um, I know that because, as some of you may know, I've been a co-founder of the, the Conversation Project, and we are trying to get people's end-of-life wishes expressed and respected. And one of the things that we se have seen in this project is what happened with the death panels. So death panels became the example of this to me, that a, the notion that a doctor should be paid for the time speaking to someone about what their end of life wishes would be was transformed into uh, the government wants to pull the plug on nanny. Um, there are all kinds of serious arguments about church and state or about reducing the deficit versus surplus spending, but rather than hear the complexities, we hear people hurling certainties at each other. So I, I confess to you also that I have um, resisted lining up for the food fight shows. My favorite story about this is when I was invited to do um, the O'Reilly Factor and racing out, skating out of my office ahead of the cracking ice of, uh, of a journalist's life. I went smack into the glass door of the Globe building, a door that had been here for the entire previous 30 years I'd been working at the paper. And I figured that that was God's way of telling me never to go on television with Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> but aside from that, what I, what I have discovered, I usually do when I'm called for one of the more polarizing shows, and they'll often have a nice young booker call you on the phone, and she'll do a pre-interview to what, find out what your opinion is on some subject, whether it's you know death penalty or, or abortion or whatever. And all you have to do is say to her, well, I have mixed feelings about that. And the phone goes back on the hook. <laughs> um, there are two other things that have happened along with this incivility as we know it in the simple way. One of them is a continuing gender gap in politics and in the media because on talk radio and talk television, most of the hosts from Rush Limbaugh, to Limbaugh on are uh, not including Tom, uh, <laughs> overwhelmingly male, but so are the callers and uh, so are the listers. <laughs> uh, so for that matter are the cast of ta cable TV guys from Chris Matthews to Bill O'Reilly with the exception of the Rachel Maddows or the ubiquitous Ann Coulter, although I am willing to do a steroid test on Ann Coulter. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my last thought is that in, in this incivility is also turning people away from civil life. In a recent Pew study, Americans do believe that radio talk shows track with polarized political views. 
We also learned that incivility does push people from civil society, and it particularly pushes women away, effectively disenfranchising them from this debate. Um, uh, to this day, for example, um, just to give you a couple of facts and then I will, in surveys, two-thirds of Americans consider a lack of civility a major problem, 72% view that politics is uncivil, half are tuning out the government and politics, and of that half, two-thirds cite the lack of civility. One last thing, I think the um, rise of incivility has gone hand in hand with the rise of disinformation. Opinion and ideology now trump facts, and we don't even agree on facts, and if we can't agree on facts, how can we have a civil conversation? Winning again trumps problems. To this day, about 23% of Americans say they believe the health care law allows government to make end-of-life decisions for seniors. Uh, so journalism is supposed to be about keeping us connected, keeping us in touch, letting us know what we need to know to decide about that fragile thing called democracy, and it is the connections that seem so fragile now, even at a time when Americans are really struggling to think of ourselves as a single people who are in it together. So. Helen, let me engage you on oh. one piece of that. Hey, we heard this morning about a sweep of time of 200 years. Now, you haven't been in the business that long. No, close. But <laughs> you've been in the business for a long time. And what's the change you've seen just in, this, in the span of your career? It wasn't patty cake at the beginning. It was Nixon and Carter and the transition to Ronald Reagan. This was not, you know, kissy face. Well, one thing, and I'm sure that there are a lot of other things, but, but one thing that has changed is the amount of time and space. Um, you need a certain amount of words to make an argument. I can't tell you what they are, but I can tell you they are more than 144 characters. Mm -hmm. um, you need a little bit more time also to comment on something. One of the things that has happened now in journalism is that you have seconds before you have to say what you think about something. I've been in the business of telling people what I think for a living, an odd way to make a living. But the thing that hasn't gotten any faster while everything else has speeded up is the amount of time it actually takes you to think. And that, and I think. And yet we speak. And that, and we are, we are sharing uh, uh, our undigested thoughts. Uh, and that, I think, um, has a, a great effect on the people who are listening and getting only the shorter and shorter sound bite. Great. Ellen Goodman, we're so glad you're here. Thank you. Joe Klein. Hi, everybody. Thanks. It's great to see some uh, very old friends. There's Ira Jackson, who was a great leaker during the uh, Kevin White administration <laughs> when I was just starting. And, 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 uh, and Steve Crosby, I knew. Steve, I don't even want to say how many years I've known you. Um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the things that Ellen spoke about, and I'm going to talk a little bit about tribes. We journalists are a tribe, and it wouldn't be proper for me, as someone who spent a lot of the last few years overseas covering wars, um, uh, embedding with American troops, uh, to, to not note that we lost one of our own yesterday, one of our very, very, very finest, Anthony Shadid. And, um, and I'm going to go right ahead and be uncivil. Whenever something like that happens, whenever four journalists from the New York Times get kidnapped in Libya trying to bring you the truth, I think of that mortal twit, um, Sarah Palin, calling us the lamestream media. There was nothing lamestream about Anthony Shadid. And in fact, I fa in fact, I stand before you unapologetically um, as a moderate. If I get around to writing my memoirs, it's going to be called Flaming Moderate. Um, <laughs> and also as a member of the mainstream media. Um, 
and uh, my definition of the main, mainstream media is that we are people who are actually edited. Um, and I'm getting goddamn sick and tired of being attacked from both the left and the right. The right calls me a liberal, the left calls me a, a neoconservative, or this or that or the other thing. Um, you know, enough already with that. <laughs> uh, the truth is, I've been doing this really interesting stuff thing. You know, I, I, I came back from Afghanistan, a trip to Afghanistan a couple of years ago and realized that I had been spending more time in the Middle East than in the Middle West. And I decided to do an old-fashioned journalistic thing, which was to get into a car and drive across the country and talk to people. And I've now done this twice. And uh, I did it in a, in a new way. I, in fact, uh, I didn't even know the name of what I was doing. It has a new name. I was crowdsourcing it. I was... I, you know, I put out an all points bulletin to Time readers and to CNN viewers and said, look, here's the route. If you got someone interesting you want me to meet, um, you want me to meet your coworkers or your neighbors or whatever, let's do it. And I would do a town meeting almost every day. Um, they ranged from one person uh, who had put out 5,000 resumes trying to get a job. Uh, he was in Chicago to 70 people in, um, in Yuba City, California. And the one thing that comes through these, these um, town meetings is that they can't stand us. I mean, they, they really hate the media, and rightly so. They feel that they are not represented. Uh, my most recent trip was going south to north from Laredo to Minnesota. And in southern states like Arkansas, Texas, um, Missouri's kind of border, you know, people were kind of amazed by all the attention that we were giving the Tea Party. You know, to them, the Tea Party people were the local lunatics who had, you know, who, had al who were always, you know, clogging up town meetings and talking about, you know, the fact that evolution shouldn't be taught in, uh, in the schools. Uh, and they made suggestions that I thought were really important. Uh, and they made comments that I thought were really important. And Yuba City, one guy got up and said, um, I read you, you've been, Ar you've been to Af Afghanistan you know, four times in the last couple of years, and yet when Afghanistan comes up on CNN, why am I watching Donna Brazil debate Bill Bennett? Um, another thing that they said is, one guy said, who was a Republican um, furniture store owner in uh, Conway, Arkansas, he said, you guys always tell us about what differentiates the candidates, how Rick Santorum's different from Mitt Romney. Why don't you ever tell us about what they have in common? You never do that. Um, and so I just want to take a couple of moments here to, to delve a little bit deeper, um, or maybe more horizontally, <laughs> since we don't do deep very well, we're journalists. Um, <laughs> what uh, Ellen was just talking about, how did we get to this place? Well, I think that there are three things that have changed to answer your question to Ellen, Tom, during my 40 some odd, God help me, years in this, and 10 presidential campaigns. There are no 12-step programs for political junkies. Um, but there are three big things. The first, and I was, I, was, I was really interested in the previous panel, the first is technology. A lot of this is the result of technology. You know, there was a panelist who said that Telemundo and, Una, and Univision were the two fastest growing networks in America. Well, if the Irish in Boston had had a TV network or in New York had a TV network in the 1840s, all of our street signs would be in English and Gaelic. And you don't want to think about what would have happened to the Union Army given the opposition of Irish immigrants to the draft. And so technology has made a lot of things possible. Uh, and it's made possible, if this is the golden age of anything, it's the golden age of marketing. You know, when I was a kid, looks like when you guys were kids too, because we don't, kids don't come to things like this, but, well, there's one over there. Um, you know, it's like, you, you stand up here and it kind of looks like you're, you're looking at a blizzard, <laughs> you know? <it's, laughs> um, but, you know, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, we had three kinds of ice cream. Now we have Baskin Robbins. 
when I was a kid, we had three networks. Everybody watched I Love Lucy on Tuesday night. Everybody watched Walter Cronkite. I mean, I can't even remember who, there was Huntley Brinkley, but I don't remember who it was on ABC. And now you have a thousand channels of nothing or, or of tribalism. And um, I, would, uh, I, I would like to associate myself um, with Mark's comments in the last debate. Uh, the fact is that marketing is essentially un-American. And I'll tell you why. Because the most important thing about this country, the most basic fact about it, the reason why there is a United States of America is because we believe that the things that we have in common are more important than the things that divide us. And by the way, that goes for Latinos too, I'd like to say to the speaker in the, uh, in the, last, in, in the last session. It doesn't make a difference what your race is, what, what country you come from, what religion you are. If you, if, if you agree in the principles of freedom, the basic principles, you're an American and you're here and you get in legally. And marketing is the exact opposite. Marketing is, the basic principle of marketing is that the things that distinguish us are the most important things. You sell to the niche, you sell to the market. And so this growth, this incredible technological growth over the last uh, 30, 40 years and the rise of marketing has retribalized us. My dad was a member of the ESPN tribe. My daughter's a member of the MTV tribe. I'm obviously a member of the C-SPAN uh, CNN tribe. And the only time when we all get together is when someone drives an airplane into a building and we have to suffer a tragedy together. And I would maintain uh, that that hasn't been very good for our democracy. Uh, you know, the effect on us as journalists of not only the thousand channels of nothing, but also the internet, is that there are so many voices now that the only way that you get yourself heard is by being obnoxious, by saying something outrageous. Um, and there's a whole generation of new gen journalists coming up who think, whose idea of civil discourse is Pat Buchanan screaming at Eleanor Clift. So, You might, you might ask me, well, how do we get out of this? <laughs> I don't know. I don't have any idea. We've reached the point where we have one political party that's essentially run by telecharlatans. You know, there is no Republican establishment now. It's Rush Limbaugh. Um, the Democrats aren't, aren't that much better. I do have, I see Tom standing up. and. Um, I do have some ideas about ways we could get through it, and I'll do that during the questions. Um, but for now, I'll do it in shorthand. Bruce Springsteen, the great Jersey philosopher, um, has a lyric in one of his songs that I think is something that we've forgotten. I mean, a good part of what's happened to our kids and to our country has been this overwhelming power of the marketplace, of, of commerce, of all the crap that we see on TV and that, and that overwhelms our lives and our kids' lives. And Springsteen's lyric uh, is, it is, we gotta start saving up for the things that money can't buy. Thank you, Joe Klein. And the things that money can't buy may, may include civil discourse. You said you're, you, you spoke about tribes, and we have a lot, and they can be fierce, and you said you're a member of the C-SPAN tribe, but that's just a narrow technical maybe explanation. What, what bigger tribe are you part of? What's your tribe? The, the media is called the media elite. What's your tribe? I'm, an, I'm a Levite. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Beyond that, slightly. Yeah, no, no, I think that... that, that that part of our problem in, in the media elite is that we really are a, a tribe that's separated from Americans. You know, I talked about the problems in the Republican Party. The problem with the Democratic Party and the liberal media elite is that we don't spend very much time with religious people. And we don't have very much sympathy for the concerns of religious people. You might, 
you know, it, when you look at the surveys of why people join evangelical churches, is it because they're all head up about abortion or birth control? No. 85% of them in studies that I've seen say that they join evangelical churches in order to protect their children from the larger culture. And that is, that is something that I have a great deal of sympathy with as a parent. Can I just say one other thing sure. about how our business has changed? Um, there's been technology, there was marketing, and there was Woodward and Bernstein. And after Woodward and Bernstein, it became possible for journalists to become celebrities. And the way you got to be a celebrity was by taking down um, you know, a, a leader, and if you didn't do it through shoe leather, leather the way Wood and Ber Woodward and Bernstein did, you did it through cynicism. And the greatest change I've seen in our business over the last 40 years has been the shift from our natural, proper skepticism to cynicism. The toughest story for a political reporter to write is a positive story about a politician. And I've developed an aphorism, and I'll leave you with this. Um, cynicism is what passes for insight among the mediocre. Joe Klein, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Kathleen Parker, please. Well, it's entirely appropriate that I follow these two, because I've been following them for a long, long time. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's true. Um, I'm not that much younger, but I, have, I am a late bloomer. And I want to say, I want to indulge in civility for just a minute, since they've already covered everything and since there are only a couple minutes left anyway. Um, I am probably a columnist because of Ellen Goodman. I, uh, I, I grew up reading her, and when I say grew up, I was already in, in newspapers, but I was uh, a big, huge fan of hers. And uh, when I finally did get syndicated in 1994 or so, um, my syndicate would go around to uh, newspapers, and, and they really do have salespeople who go to the papers and try to, you know, you're a product and they try to sell you. And the newspaper editors, the editorial page editors would say uniformly, uh, we don't need her, we have Goodman because all women are the same, right? You knew that. Um, over time, and that's how much things have changed, although there still are not that, very, that many women on op-ed pages, and, and we can, that's a whole other uh, conversation. But I also um, am, am a huge admirer of Joe's, and he is modest. Uh, I'm glad he mentioned that he's been to Af Afghanistan four times, because he really is a standard bearer for the kind of quality journalism that we all depend on. And he's, he's brave, and uh, he, he really is literally a boots-on-the-ground guy. So. Hats off, and I'm, I'm proud to be on the stage with these two. Um, yeah, and you will be buying dinner, of course. Uh, you may have noticed it's hard to talk about incivility without the name Sarah Palin coming up. I am not going to mention it myself. <laughs> and that is why, that's because I know something about incivility. On um, September 26, 2008, um, I wrote a column. I remember the date because it was my birthday and, and my, my gift from the reading public was uh, 20,000 emails. And uh, ranging in suggestions that you know, my mother should have aborted me or I should consider uh, killing myself. I mean, this is the kind of, uh, of response I, uh, that came in, you know, as, as a result of my suggesting mildly, I thought, that Sarah Palin was perhaps not quite ready for prime time. I have subsequently rested my case, and I'm waiting for those uh, 20,000 people to get back in touch. <laughs> so the question was, uh, at least my assignment as I read it, was to answer the question, do the media contribute uh, to incivility? And, and I would say yes, to some extent. Um, can the media help change the tone of discourse? And I would say yes, but not much. Um, both Joe and Ellen have touched on some of these things, so I won't, re I won't uh, repeat, but um, I do have a couple of ideas. First of all, it's difficult to talk about the media because it's not a monolithic entity anymore. We are all media. And one of the things that has changed significantly that I think has led to this, this lack of civility in the, in the public square, and this is something that both of these uh, mentioned in, or at least uh, touched on, the technology, the technological enablement of people to connect 
does two things. Number one, it allows them to speak quickly and without thought. Number two, it allows us to balkanize and to find, we, we congregate in, in sort of ideological cubicles where we find people of like mind and we never have to actually meet and talk with one another. But it has another effect, I think, which is that when you are with your kind, the rest of the world becomes the other. And you know, we got to know that little word uh, during the 2008 uh, campaign when, when the far right was often referring to President Obama, well, not yet as President, but Barack Obama as that guy or the, you know, they, he was characterized frequently as the other. Essentially what we do in that case is we, we objectify the person, we dehumanize them, and that makes it much easier to say things that we would never say to someone's face. And speaking of which, am I still on? Because I can't, I am. When I get these horrible emails, and I get thousands a week, um, they're not all horrible, but a good many of them are, and people say things that you just can't even imagine, you know? I think, really? I mean, I personally have a sign on my computer that says, do not drink and send. <laughs> I have to imagine that there are a lot of drunks out there who just sort of have it for me. Um, <laughs> but anyway, usually I just hit delete. It's pretty easy when you read the subject line. It says, you stupid, blah, 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 right? Delete. That's why God made delete. Love that button. Um, but every now and then I'll read one just out of curiosity. And if I take the time to respond, and I do it in a civil way, I mean, I'm not going to get in an argument with these people, but I'll write back and say, gosh, I'm sorry you didn't like the column. Um, must have had a hard day, they will invariably write back in a human fashion, apologetically, and say, I'm so sorry, I don't know why I said that. My favorite was from a, a little girl, uh, she was probably about 12, in uh, California. She said some horrible things to me, and because she was so young, I decided to respond. I had a child about that age at the time, and I wrote her and I said, you know, I just have to say, if my son had written someone the way you wrote me and said those things, I would be very disappointed in him. Um, and I'm sorry you felt that you needed to do that. And she wrote back and she said, I could tell she was almost tearfully responding. She said, I'm so sorry I said that. I don't know why I did. I had a fight with my sister. Nobody will talk to me. Will you talk to me? And so we began this little exchange by email. My point is simply that when we do recognize each other as fellow human beings, we treat each other better, clearly. So the trick is to, to somehow cease this, uh, this balkanization that we, that we seem to seek out, These uh, try to confine ourselves to communities that make us feel, to, that affirm our, our, our own ideas. Will this ever happen? Uh, probably not. Uh, the problem is, I had a brief stint on television. Some of you may be aware of that. By the way, I am so paranoid up here because I know that somebody's tweeting or something, somebody's seeing something, some, hearing what I'm saying, and it's going out on the blogosphere, and I'm going to be bombarded, right? Okay, so this is, this is, a, way, this is a way that incivility suppresses speech. You know, if you're afraid you're going to get hit too hard, you just don't bother. You don't say the things that need to be said. Am I doing that? I am? Oh, so sorry. Glad my stomach wasn't growling. That's why I couldn't hear myself. <laughs> I'm almost done here. Um, but the problem is that, look, when I started writing my column and, and they were trying to sell me, it was like, okay, we have to sell her something. You either have to be left or you have to be right. You have to be a conservative or you have to be a liberal. She was a liberal, so I had to be a conservative, right, essentially. The problem is, number one, I've never been a Republican. Um, I'm not, I mean, I'm a conservative about some things. I'm not about everything. I think I'm a, a flaming centrist, personally. But boy, that does not sell. You know, and when you go on TV, they want a fight. They want tension. They want conflict. It's, by the way, the motto is ratings, ratings, ratings. And what I learned from that is that if, we, if biting the heads off chickens would make people watch our show, we would bite the heads off chickens. And you're just not good TV, you know, over and over. Is, is she good TV? Is he good TV? Talking about guests. Um, would we have so-and-so on? Well, you know, 
not that good looking, not that, you know, kind of talks too quietly, not very forceful. I mean, there are all these criteria that, that are used to determine whether a person is going to make good TV. And, you know, but that's the marketplace. If, if people don't tune in, then you don't have advertising, you don't have to show, you know how it works. So the problem with, you know, I don't see how we fix this problem as long as the market dictates whether a person is good TV. Yes. Okay, so we've got left and right. You cut me off. I yeah, have like sorry. Four yeah, pages see, here. I know. Yeah, well, you can read them from your seat. This is what happens when you go last. Okay, okay. okay. Punch. Um, you, we got left. We got right. You got put in the right box. Now look out across the sort of horizon of media and culture and civility and civility. The charge is made that there's more incivility on the right. Do you buy that? Well, at the moment, the right is is out of favor, and so they are the ones who are trying to, you know get their way back in. And so, of course, they're going to be the ones that are more critical. Uh, you know, th there is a, see, here I go. I'm, I'm censoring myself because don't do it. Don't they're do watching. It. <laughs> they're not that They're powerful. coming after me. Um, 20,000 emails tonight. Look, some of, the, some of the base in the Republican Party, this is no secret, are, are easily riled on a number of uh, subjects. And there are certain, um, you know, documentable incidents of, of, of incivility on the far right. Now, but let's just remember, was it Maxine Waters who just said Republicans are demons, that the House members, House Republicans are demons? So you can find it in both places, but I think the party out of favor in the moment is going to be the one that's characterized as the most uh, outrageous. We'll dive on in. Kathleen Parker, All thank right. you very much. Kathleen Parker, thank you. Thank you. All right, our time is short, and it's great to have the three of you. So let me just start with the chicken and egg question. We have a society, a culture that's perceived as less civil than it has been. The media is seen as having a role in that. Now, we, you're all talking about the market, how it, we hear how it drives the media, but how, look at the chicken and egg question, Ellen. Is, it, is the media become coarsened, let's say, by financial imperatives, and therefore is driving, driving a coarsening or incivility in our society, or is there something in the society is driving incivility, and if so, what? Yes. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Ellen. Um, Joe, no, to Ellen. You know, I, I, it's, it's, um, I was trying to think of a comparison. It's Americans all hate uh, the violation of somebody's privacy. You know, you, 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 you tell a story, it's a National Enquirer story, and everybody goes tut tut while they're buying it at the checkout <laughs> counter. So there is, it's a real complex relationship because there's a certain portion of people that really do relate to and want to see the food fight part, and there's a certain portion of people who just say, oh, I can't even listen to it. It's like if you look at the if you look at who was voting for Newt Gingrich and who was not, if you look at that, and there are a lot of people, a lot of them, again, if I go back to the gender gap thing, a lot of them are women who say, God, the last thing I need to hear is another angry man yelling at me. <laughs> and they drop out of the system. They dropped out of Gingrich supporters, but in this case, they also um, drop out of the system. So that the, um, uh, the siloing of um, an audience for cable television and for radio and so forth may get narrow, but they're getting all of that, all of all they need by uh, increasingly polarizing that part. So uh, it quote works for the market, even while it destroys the uh, civility. It, it destroys the uh, public engagement. So, so the case gets made that we are simply in a less comfortable world. The, world's, the economy is globalized. Uh, American uh, dominance is by no means assured. Our economic status is under fire and is eroded for an awful lot of people. And that that is what has pulled the plug on incivility, which was easier when the gravy was flowing deeper. Well, I mean, you know, it's certainly a more complicated world. And, and, and Mark Lilla was right about that in the previous panel. And uh, at a time when the world is getting so much more complicated and there are decisions, I mean, even the question of abortion is a far more complicated question now that we have sonograms. I mean, it has changed the numbers in this country in a significant way. Um, but I think that, that affluence, I named a character in Primary Colors after this, Orlando Ozio, the governor of New York. Um, Machiavelli said, um, 
Ozio is the greatest enemy of a republic. What's Ozio? Italian speakers would know that it's indolence. And over the last, since the end of World War II, we have had an unprecedented period of peace and prosperity in this country. And during that time, the habits of citizenship have waned. Not only have they waned, but it's become more difficult to be a really well-informed citizen. You, you think affluence undermines citizenship. The argument's getting made the other way now that it's economic pressure, economic erosion that's undermining citizenship or civility. Well, I think, I, I, I think that uh, affluence created this world of sex and more sex and violence and consumerism um, that you see on TV and that has undermined, you know, uh, family structure, especially among the poor. Uh, I mean, Adam Smith said that, you know, if a nobleman gets drunk, he doesn't have to work the next day. If a, if a workman gets drunk, he loses his job. And you just made the church's argument against contraception. Did I? hand out an aspirin? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that the tendency, I mean, and you talk about incivility on the right, that's certainly true now, but 20 years ago when I was making Daniel Patrick Moynihan's argument about the necessity of a two-person, uh, two-parent family uh, in the inner cities when I was working for New York Magazine, I was getting death threats from the left. So, you know, the fact is that affluence has made, has, has, has had a very significant effect on intellectual and moral rigor. That's so interesting. If I can just chime in here. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the media are also guilty of being incivil, uncivil within right. their own yeah. house. Um, because the way I got labeled a conservative originally was because in 1987, when I first started writing a column, it was called Women, and I was at the time a single mother, and I wrote about the need for children to have a two-parent household. Mm. Well, I was a pariah in my own Absolutely. newsroom. I mean, they would, they treated me so shabbily. They had a little contest in the main news, newsroom, which was, would you rather read a Kathleen Parker column or crawl across the newsroom on your belly? And these girls would hop down and crawl, you know, scuttle across. So it ain't fun to uh, swim no. upstream against the orthodoxy, no matter where it's from. Hey, may I ask, because we can hear the gun shyness. So what sounds like that, Kathleen, after the 20,000 emails and after the girls crawling on the belly, I mean, how much, Part of the complaint about the media is that they're not really saying what they think. They're sort of tailoring something either for marketing reasons or to suck up to one particular tribe or perspective. I mean, how much of what you really what feel, do I believe, really think? observe are, are you I tell, I say exactly what I think and I take the hits and that's, it's not fun. I will just say it's not fun, but, it, but it's what I do and that's why I live in a basement. And uh, <laughs> there's a little, they call it the bunker. And uh, no, it is, it's very, it's hard. I mean, I think anyone who says, oh, none of that bothers me is just not telling the truth. It Ellen? does bother you, mm. uh, right? I would say, oh, none of that bothers me, honestly. I mean, it seems to me in life you give pe five people the chits to make you feel bad about yourself. Mm. And okay, well, you I'm go, this you, my shrink. <laughs> you don't deal, you don't give those chits to anybody who has your email address. But I would say, <laughs> I would say to just anybody who has your email address, but just maybe I... Well, it runs at the end of my column in 450 yeah. papers. Yeah, right, exactly, you know. <laughs> um, but I, uh, but, um, uh, yeah, now I've, now I've lost it. That's was, all right. D well, don't give those, only, only be judged by a few, yet that's hard when but there's so I much incivility. Say, what I was going to say is it seems to me that in any opinion piece, one thing that I always tried to do was tip my hat to the people I knew disagreed with me, respectfully. Right. That there would be a paragraph in that that let them know I knew mm -hmm. the other side of this issue. Now, often, again, when columns started shrinking from 800 words to 750 to 700 to, to no 500 to to whatever the headline was on the Drudge Report, which is often where you get the 20,000 nutcakes from, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, that understanding, that sense that you were in dialogue with people, that you were working through the arguments as they saw them and you saw them, and then coming to your conclusion while allowing the possibility that they weren't going to follow you to that last line. Well, and I agree with what you're changed. saying, but I'm not talking about the crazies. I don't care what they think. Yeah. But I mean, 
like you, I, I, had, I lost several speeches right after that Palin column. You know, I was banned from certain circles. I mean, it, it's ridiculous, but I mean, if that's your livelihood, suddenly that's withdrawn because your opinion didn't fit with what people yeah, expected. I, when you're a banishment. Yeah. Uh, Joe, jo, let me ask you, you said, talking about President Obama and some of the anger and insinuation being directed at the president. This was a couple of years ago now. This was 09, but you said, is, has become downright dangerous. Now, part of why people come out today and part of why they're listening and participating around the country, and by the way, I'll take your comments and questions in just a minute here, is this sense of danger that comes along with a sense of incivility, that it's simply dangerous. It can be dangerous to a career or a speaking engagement, but dangerous to a polity, to a nation. Mm -hmm. Is it at a dangerous level today? Danger is what happened to Tony Shadid. Yeah. Danger is not saying what you think on a, on a television show. Well, or well, well let, let me hold that thought though, because I understand that I, Tony Shadid lost his life. But I would assert that the free, robust civil discourse in a democracy, losing that does have a, an, an element of danger to it, if that's what we're talking I, I about. Think, I think that if you would ask the, the Secret Service, the level of death threats against this president right now is unprecedented by orders of magnitude. And what's happening in this country is really, I mean, the, the most profound conversation about what was happening in this country was I had, uh, took place in Tehran the week before their election. And I was talking to these two guys, uh, both had been educated in the States. One had been a doctor, the other had been an engineer. Doctor hadn't been here in 15 years, the engineer uh, came back for conferences and uh, the doctor asked him, so what's it like there now? And the engineer started laughing, he said, you wouldn't recognize the place, they don't have any Americans left. And, and two weeks later, I mean, one of the, you know, they actually pay me to do this, it's really kind of amazing, but two weeks later I'm at a tea party meeting in Arkansas and it is a totally white group and as I listen to them, I hear them expressing this uncontrolled fear that that's true, that there aren't any Americans left, that all of a sudden the South Asians run all the, um, the, you know, the convenience stores and the Mexicans are crawling all over the place and my grandson just became gay and my granddaughter is, is dating a, a black person and the President of the United States doesn't even have the good sense to be black or white and his middle name is Hussein and I'm going to go crazy. <laughs> And I think that that's really out there, and it just, and, and as a journalist, it really pisses me off when, when a woman stands up at a Rick Santorum meeting and calls the President of the United States an avowed Muslim, and Rick Santorum doesn't say to her, no, he is not. Kathleen, what Rick Santorum does say, and he's not the only one, he says if Barack Obama is reelected, you will lose, he says to his audience. Uh, the America we've known, America as we've known it. What's he saying there? What's he talking about? I have no idea. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't begin to guess. I mean, I, well, what's the, what's, the, what's the code there? If you will. Uh, yeah, you know, first of all, Rick Santorum is not going to be president of the United States, so relax. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, it's a complicated question and deserves a more complicated answer than I can provide, especially since I'm not his spokesperson. But I, I'm, I think he's talking about, you know, the, the, the multi-trillion dollar budget and the, the, the financial issues primarily. Not the no. I don't American know as that Happy Days is slipping away. You think he's getting I, back to I've him? been sure. covering these birds for the last six months, and, they are, and the, the amount of code language that's going out you know, is just, is really astonishing. When Newt Gingrich calls Barack Obama the most radical president in the history of the country, what does that mean? When he calls him a Saul Alinsky radical, when I would bet you 97% of the American people don't know who Saul Alinsky was, except for the fact that his name sounds a little Jewish. Um, I mean, the, the signals that are being sent in this campaign are, they are so thick. Well, I'm, I'm very attentive to that because I've lived in South Carolina for 20 years and, and I'm especially attuned to words, phraseology, such as, you know, welfare president or food stamp president, because that sort of harkens president. back to the welfare, you know, queens and it, it, it certainly feels like it's trying to summon racist animus to me. Um, but I, I hesitate to, to speak for somebody like Santorum when, you know, he's gonna, <coughs> 
I just don't have any clue uh, what he's enough. trying to talk about. Uh, Ellen, you've written about Barack Obama, who came in. You wrote, Oprah, uh, Obama was the Oprah candidate. This is a couple of years ago you wrote. Who believed we could talk with anyone, even our enemies. This seems to be kind of at the heart of what civil discourse would be, should be, was, may one day be about. So you wrote this in 09. Now we are, here we are in 12. What have we learned from that effort, that experiment, that posture? Well, one thing we learned that if Hillary had been elected president, everybody would be sitting around here saying, see, I told you she was polarizing. <laughs> That's why we're in the fix for it now, right? But if Hillary had been elected and, and president, instead, she wouldn't have gone for universal health care. No, but instead, uh, we have uh, uh, Obama, who did, in many elegant and eloquent ways in his book, describe how he listened to people in his own family and other cultures and uh, understood in a way that few people do. He could hear with stereophonic mm -hmm. uh, capacity the different, argument, the different discussions and try to come to uh, some, uh, under, something that would work for all of them. But again, he, he met an immovable force. So what happened was he said, I'll compromise. I'm going to draw the line right there. And then the other people said, OK, from here we start negotiating. They'll draw the line right there. And what happens when you want to uh, uh, find common ground with somebody who's standing behind their own goalpost? And I probably screwed the football metaphor, but you know. Did, did he fail in his healing, or is the country unhealable in the way that he seemed to promise? Uh, I would say that it's not the country that's unhealable, but the yearning that was expressed um, by the number of people who resonated to that. And in fact, in the Democratic primary of 208, who mm -hmm. chose him over Hillary for mm -hmm. precisely that kind of reason. That yearning is still there and expressed in groups like this as well. But a yearning comes up against uh, a, a brick wall, and um, it yeah. has not, it just hasn't, it hasn't, it failed hasn't in that given sense. Away. Joe? You know, I think he's done a pretty good job. You know, I, I, I think that, uh, and, and I think that when you look at the polling, when you look at the polling, the American people think he's done a pretty good job. And, you know, when you look at the polling about the need to compromise on something like the debt ceiling or, you know, revenues, um, the numbers are astronomical. They find exactly what I find on my road trips. 89% of the people would rather have politicians who compromise than stick with their principles. The president has reflected that. He's done it very patiently, and now we're seeing people recognize that. I will also say he has record that disapproval levels, what? and he, he, his, disapproval records, re, his disapproval levels are very high as well. Yeah, and, and we're in the midst of, the, of a historic recession. Um, that, was, that was caused by historic immorality and greed on Wall Street. And, um, and, and people are scared, and, and people see their jobs going to China. I mean, he hasn't been perfect. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've had this conversation with him. You know, I, he, he asked me after one of my road trips, what did you find? And I said, well, you know, they don't have any idea what your position is on China, and they're obsessed about their jobs going to China. So he hasn't been perfect. But I think that what I've found is that people see him as intelligent, reasonable, nice. Uh, Except for maybe 20 to 25 percent of the people who think he is a secret Muslim, um, you know, that revolutionary. Is, that yeah, who wants to pull the pillow on grandma? Yeah, the one, the I agree. I agree with what Joe said. I think I was referring only to his relationship. Uh, his political relationship in, in Congress, because I think Joe is right. People still want what he has tried to sell. We've and got time for just a couple of questions. The proof of that will be if, in the next election, really. Let's get a question right here. I'm Janet Penn, and one of the things that I haven't heard today is what skills do you need to engage in civil discourse? And I would argue that you need specific skills that are not being taught. If we want to have our young people have conversations when they know they're going to disagree, mm -hmm. you need to know how to ask a question that says, I'm going to ask a question that seeks to understand your position, even though I know I'm not going to do that. So that's what I do. I have an organization, Youth Lead, Youth Leaders Engaging Across Differences, and that's what we do. And a, several years ago, high school students um, put together an event. 400 people showed up at a synagogue. It was Ramadan. There were 100 Muslims showed up at the synagogue. I called major Boston TV stations, and they said, 
well, Janet, you know, it's not really news. And I'm like, wait a second, you're telling me that 15 to 17 year olds created this place for Muslims and Jews and Christians and, and Hindus to come together. And the media screws it up again. And the media said, well, it's not news. So what I'm asking is, I think two, two points. One is, we need the skills, and I think we need to be talking about what, skill, what are those skills and have opportunities to do that. And then number two, mm -hmm. make sure that the media will write about it. Uh, good luck with that. Kathleen, let me ask you about that. Thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't the right answer. <laughs> Kathleen Parker, you wrote, the real challenge for the civility-minded is that incivility is more exciting. I don't know if you remember this column. I have no idea what you're uh, talking about. Uh, <laughs> you, you're right. You if, if we really there. want civility to prevail, we have to find a way to make it exciting. To this point, uh, making debate cool is a challenge, not least because clear thinking is hard work that requires skill and discipline. Can you make civility exciting? Um, well, we could, we could sure try. You know, the, I, I agree with you that teaching debate in schools, making that sort of part of the curriculum would be a wonderful way to get kids involved. I think they would like to be engaged in that way and would learn not only how to argue with civility, but also how to talk about the issues that I think actually they're probably, if they knew about them, if they were engaged in a serious way, they would be interested in them. Um, as for the media, I have to come to the defense of, of media um, a little bit because what's happened is all of our newspapers have been gutted. We don't have the staffs anymore to send out to do stories. We don't have investigative teams anymore. We don't have bureaus anymore. And, and they have to really pick and choose what they go out and cover. So that might have been at least a factor. Ellen? I, I think all that's true. I've watched that happen. But it's equally true that the social media has picked up and so you have to make decisions about who's going to cover mm -hmm. that story, for example. It isn't going to be the New York Times that covers that story, but it may very well be uh, the local... Local access local, TV. Local or, ac mm -hmm. Not even TV, the local access TV or, oh. or the, you know... It's Web like, writer. Uh, it's like the uh, parents' blog in your community. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens and that can move along through the social media. You know, Kathleen said some very nice things about both of us, but I got to say that any journalist who could write the sentence that you just read is, is so worth the price of admission. I mean, really. And, and, and it's true, and it is an essential problem of our society is that things are too exciting. I mean, you need, you know, to have a democracy, to have citizenship. We're trying to have a democracy without citizens. It's really amazing. You need, we need to be more contemplative. We need to have times when we're not excited, when we're not suffering from national attention deficit disorder. We need, we need to have, and the way to do that is, as I said before, it involves intellectual and moral rigor. And that is something that we've lost throughout the society except for one sector, and that is the United States military. Wow, to have that as, the, as a single sector that has that, I don't know if I agree, but that's, that's quite an idea. One more, yes please. Thank you, my name is Chris Stockwell, I'm from Marblehead, Massachusetts. The farther right and the farther left quadrants of the political spectrum are today completely in charge and really devoid of compromise. There's a third segment to the, to the political spectrum, and that's the centrists, the moderate American middle majority. Where are they? Why can't we hear them? Why aren't they speaking? And can we make that moderate middle majority exciting and interesting to solve this problem that we're in? Thank, Thank you. you. Kathleen. I, I, I call those the normals. Yeah. They're the normals, and they're busy, they're at work, they're taking care of their kids, they're, you're, you know, they're not obsessing about every little thing. I mean, the truth is, the left and the right, the far extremes, dominate the conversation, I agree completely. The vast middle is where most of us live, um, but it doesn't sell, because it's not exciting. It's normal, you mm -hmm. know? The cameras are going to go to the guy that's carrying a, a, a sign of some sort, that's, that's, you know, got some horrible image of the president on it. Um, they're going to go to the, the protesters, the tea parties. The, if they get in a fight, all the better. I mean, that's where the, you know, they, they follow the heat. And that's the problem. We need to make centrism cool. Joe, <laughs> I'll come to the flaming centrist Joe first. Yeah. Well, I did, I did a town meeting in a suburb of St. Louis. And uh, it was about 20 or 30 people. 
and most of them were moderate Republicans or Democrats. By the way, it, always, it, it really does break down in the cliche, the husbands are Republicans, the wives are Democrats, but they agree on most stuff. There was one Tea Party member, one self-described Tea Party member at this town meeting, and he, he spent maybe 53% of the time talking. And everybody else, nobody wanted to get into a fight with him because it wasn't neighborly. One guy did for a little bit. Um, he was a self-described liberal. Um, but it's, you know, we work so hard now. People spend so many hours working and, you know, sometimes two jobs and, uh, and men and women working. And, and, and we don't have that much time or tolerance for unpleasantness in, in the hours that we're not working. And I think that there, this has been, this was a political strategy that was invented by Patrick H. Cadell in the Alan Cranston Senate race in 1984. It can be actually pinpointed. I did, I did so in one of my books, uh, Politics Lost. And what Cadell discovered was that nobody liked Alan Cranston, his candidate. And uh, the only way to elect Hall Alan Cranston was get, to get nobody to like the other guy who was running against him and to depress turnout. And political consultants for the last 30 years in race after race after race have been studiously engaged in creative obnoxiousness. And you're seeing it in the Republican race right now where despite their vast hatred of Barack Obama, turnout is plummeting except for Ron Paul. So I think that it's a real problem. But people have to overcome their reticence and say, hey, wait a second, you're stealing our country, you extreme jerks. Ellen, the, our clock well, is running out on us here. I, I just wasn't going to accept the premise that the extreme right and the extreme left are equally extreme because the left has moved so far, it's now the extreme right versus what used to be called left center, just to make that, you know, the whole system has moved, but we still think of it. But there is also a journalistic bias, which I would fight, but a journalistic bias to have an other hand. In other words, you know, right, on exactly. the one hand, we interview a person who's, who's you know, pro-chipmunks, and now we have to find somebody who's opposed to chipmunks. It's the way the media literally created Phyllis Schlafly as the anti-feminist in the 70s, and it's the, we, we seem to need uh, two, and by the way, only two uh, sides to any issue. Two of every kind. Ellen, look, we've just got a minute here. Look for the light with us for a second. Pull out those threads that may or are, that may turn or are turning the country back toward a more civil discourse, and not a weak tea civil discourse, but a vigorous, rich one, one that doesn't uh, duck big moral issues, one that really engages, one that engages all the cultures and all the sectors of our society. What, what, what are the elements in the media or beyond that may, that may take us there? Well, I, I'm, I'm not Ms. Hopeful, but <laughs> I would say that um, uh, the counter side to all the horrible, you know, nasty emails that Kathleen gets, that I've gotten, that Joe gets, is that out there there is a group of engaged people, many of whom are going to their own worlds where they, their own online communities, where they do literally discuss something fully. And let us hope that they go from there to bring it into the uh, larger uh, uh, world where the rest of us are living. But there is a lot of fermenting, thoughtful, small community, um, uh, civil co conversation going on. Be your own media, and, and maybe, maybe on, on the back of that we, we cross this river. Um, I'm very grateful to the three of you for being with us. It's been an incredible day of investigation and exploration to all of you in the hall here and around the country. This, uh, this day on civil discourse and American democracy comes to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen Goodman, Joe Klein, Kathleen Parker. Thank you, thank you. Ira, Charlie. So we get to wrap it up, Ira. It's been a remarkable day. I'll be really brief. When Steve Crosby and I sat down over eggs and orange juice a couple of years ago, I had dreamed of this day. What I could not have imagined is how urgent and vital such a discussion would be given, 
given the inexorable decline in political discourse in our country. We are in the midst of a time of great change. Technology is rewriting our personal and professional relationships and our roles as citizens in our democracy. Information is aspirated and our common experience is vanishing along with our sense of a common destiny and shared goals. Into this fray we have entered today. It is but a beginning. I am so grateful to our great speakers whose knowledge and passions have illuminated a central issue of our time. And as the general manager of WBUR, I would be deeply remiss not thanking Tom Ashbrook. Yeah. Who, I, who I, I hope, I know you will agree, is simply a treasure for this city and for the country. Uh, thank you, Tom, for a long and fascinating and beautifully moderated day. Um, my deep thanks also to a few others, David Tobaldi, Eben Weisman, Ricardo Ramos, Chris Zern, Judy Stoya, the Center for Civil Discourse Director, Mary Jane Patron, Ira Jackson, who will wrap this up in one second, Jamie Ennis, Max Linsky, and especially uh, Dean Steve Crosby, whose last day on the job is tomorrow, where we will think about and wrap up uh, this incredible forum. Cullen Murphy, who's an editor at large at Vanity Fair and the author of God's Jury, The Inquisition and the Making of the Modern World, uh, wrote a brilliant article in the New York Times last week that I recommend to you all called The Certainty of Doubt. He wrote, the drafters of the United States Constitution, fearful of rule by one opinion, whether the tyrants or the mobs, created a governmental structure premised on the idea that human beings are fallible, fickle, and unreliable, and in fundamental ways not to be trusted. Triumphalist rhetoric about the Constitution ignores the skeptical view of human nature that underlies it. Doubt, he says, sometimes comes across as feeble and meek, apologetic and obstructionist. On occasion it is, but it's also a powerful defensive instrument. Doubt can be a bulwark. We should inscribe that in marble someplace. I share Mr. Murphy's views about the power of doubt, the virtues of seeing our lives in shades of gray from time to time rather than always in absolutes of black and white. In these thoughts, I believe, are the seeds of civility. Today at this National Forum on Civility in American Democracy, we have begun, begun an important discussion which this center will continue and enrich. I hope you will all be part of that ongoing conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks for your partnership. I'm unembarrassed about being redundant in thanking Tom Ashbrook and Charlie Kravitz and the team from WBUR who produce, I think we'd all agree, the best radio on radio for making a complicated issue both entertaining and educational. Thank you, Tom. And I'm also equally unapologetic about wanting to uh, give a shout out to the Dean of the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Policy here at UMass Boston. Steve Crosby is the founding dean of the McCormick Graduate School. He and Charlie cooked up this idea. He's taking on arguably the second most important job in the Commonwealth as chair of the new Gaming Commission. This is his next to last day on the job and this is part of his legacy so we can't let this fail. Thanks, Steve. I think you'll agree with me that uh, this has been a rich and textured and lively and informative day. I think Tom and the 12 panelists have modeled civility. Uh, Charlie's also right that this is just the beginning. About 40 of us will spend the day tomorrow trying to draft a civility charter and to work on what we call democracy debates and maybe even to model a political debate that incorporates some of these ideas. So continue to be engaged. I think it was uh, General Jack Ripper in Strange Love who uh, said uh, war is too important to be left to the generals. I think we're all in agreement or we wouldn't be here. 
that democracy is too important to be left just to the pundits or the politicians or the parties. It requires all of us as active and engaged citizens. Give us your ideas. We're going to work at reclaiming our American heritage and our American democracy. Maybe Bruce Springsteen did say it best, but uh, I'm reminded of, of a, a quote from the inaugural address of President John F. Kennedy, whose library stands just a thousand feet from where we meet here at UMass Boston, and I'll conclude our day by quoting him. So let us begin anew, he said, remembering on both sides, perhaps we'd want to say on all sides, that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Thank you very much. Civility and American Democracy, a national forum, has been brought to you by UMass Boston in partnership with Mass Humanities, 90.9 WBUR, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the University of Alaska, the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University, Claremont Graduate University, the Evans School of Public Policy at the University of Washington, the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs and Civic Engagement at Colby College, the National Institute for Civil Discourse at the University of Arizona, the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, the Robert F. Wagner School of Public Service at New York University, and the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State University.